360 grad dongled live stream. Says we're live. We're populating. Here we go. We're live. Are we, we're live. Are we really live? Okay. It seems I've that way. Email from you now. It's really happening. It's really happening. <laughs> Welcome one and all. Once again, we've pushed the techie issues to the start of the show. I know you all enjoy this very much. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, one and all. Uh, yeah, um, boys, again, it's all going wrong. <laughs> what is going on with this software? It's amazing. We almost week fixed week, it. But we almost did. We thought yeah. we were going to go completely glitch-free this week, but it, it wasn't to be. So thank you all very much indeed for hanging around and waiting for us again. Uh, <laughs> lovely to see you all. Uh, I'm uh, in a, coming to you live from a really crappy stinky hotel room in Prague but I'm going to read uh, a little bit of the sign that's behind me here this this says I don't know if you can see that if the AF will kick in oh there we there go it, is. it says uh, there you go it says we wish you a pleasant stay we do everything to make you feel good here what an offer wow I can't find anyone to fulfill that wish but there, there you go so, <laughs> so good evening gentlemen how are we <laughs> Where are we? What are we up to? Well, Jen's uh, nowhere new. No, not really. I'm I'm in the uh, dining room. It's just been one of those days where uh, we've been leasing our cars for three years, and they're about to be up. So it was like uh, I'm just trying to get those all ready. So I've just been doing that until we hooked everything up. And then I'm taking them in tomorrow to see what's next. Am I going to buy two vehicles? Am I going to lease more vehicles? I know you're in kind of car, truck land too, minivan land. Caleb, how are you? Yep. Uh, good. Apparently, I can't come in at a uh, higher resolution. Gem and I got that sorted, and I was juicy HD, but then my audio was like <laughs> echoing throughout the internet or something. Can that be uh, your handle, juicy HD? That'd be a good handle. Juicy HD. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see that website, but yeah. That's fine. <laughs> All Jeez. right. There you All go. Right. Let's keep going. Life's a bag of dongles. You never know which one you're going to get, is. as Chris said. Yo, Guillermo. Hey, Desmond. <laughs> uh, Bad Karma, Har Harrison, uh, David, 360 Grad, Joseph, Bart Johnson Productions, Sky, London, Bad, well, eh, Subvids. What's up? How are you? Uh, do we have Grumpy here? Grumpy, I haven't seen. Travis is here. I haven't seen Grumpy. David. I haven't seen Grumpy. Yeah. Rob. I've just seen uh, Dave. How are you doing? Yeah. Got a nice crew here. Yeah, very nice. I'll let you take over. <laughs> this is all you. All right. Apparently, I haven't hosted in a while, and uh, and Ben reminded me. I just have no idea what's going on. I've been on the road so much. Next week, I will host. I apologize. No, no. no. Well, I, I got a little chuck because it, it, was, it, it was Caleb, then, then it was me, then it was Caleb. Now it's me. So, you know, I, just, <laughs> I, I thought you'd kind of elevated yourself above the level of hosting now, and we're just kind of going to be the sage. Just ben, kind of chime ben, in with your wisdom. Absolutely not. Next week, absolutely you're going to log on and look at Jem, Jem's YouTube channel, and your face is going to be the little thumbnail. He's just slowly <laughs> <laughs> replacing himself with you. <laughs> well, we keep, we keep telling Ben he needs to have a YouTube channel, so I go. figured this is, a, this is the way to do it. So that would be great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thank you for elevating my exposure. All right. I think after that little trauma of getting this thing to work yet again, we're all in need of a drink. So mm. let's get straight to it. Let's start with let's start with Jem this week. What are you on? Uh, I'm sticking with uh, Kulela. I need it. I need smoky mm -hmm. and sweet. So that's what I'm having. And uh, it's probably – I'm probably going to put this in front of Lagavulin 16 nowadays. I think Ooh. I like it, and it's about thirty dollars less per bottle. So Yum. there you go. Wow. That's what I'm having. Very good. Right, Caleb, what are you draining the dregs of this week? Um, I'm going to be uh, out and about this evening, so I'm going to not do liquor, and we're going to do uh, a good old fat tire. Mm, nice. Mm -hmm. I dig it. Come on, focus. There we go. There, there you go. go. Excellent. Nothing fancy, but I quite enjoy it. And I'm going to use my uh, tw vintage oh. 2013 oh. wooden camera. Oh, I'm a little jealous. I have right the same now. one. I have the same one. And sadly, because I'm in a hotel room and we know how this goes, because twice before I've tried to open a bottle of beer in a hotel room on this show 
and slice my hand open live. Yes, we've so seen today, that. Yeah, so today I'm in a, this is like a self-catering kind of sweet thing. So I would have expected this to have had a bottle opener. Alas, no. So I have pre-prized the top off this so that I can I can save the bleeding. There you go. But this is, seeing as we're in Prague and I'm in the middle of Prague and there are no shops in the middle of, the pra of Prague, just horrible touristy overpriced things. So I have gone with the I classic can see what you're having. beer. There we go. This is mm. Pilsner Urquell. Yes. This no, is the no original. Budvar. No Budvar for you. I was going to get Budvar, but it's so terrible. It is a lot better. So Budvar, for those of you that don't know, is the original Budweiser. Towns here mm. in the Czech Republic generally have a German name and a Czech name. And the city of um, Česka Budjevice, to the south of where I am right now, the German name is Budweiser. So the original Budweiser is actually from Czech and tastes infinitely better, but it's still not all that great. <laughs> uh, this is the actual original Pilsner, um, any Pilsner, that's where it comes from, the city of Pilsen, which is about 50 miles to the west of where I am right now. Mm. So, gentlemen, let's, let's do a cheers and then we can crack on. Gentlemen in chat, we've got some Samuel Adams, we've got some Heineken. Cheers. 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 Nazdravi. Nazdravi. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I needed that. Oh, yeah. That's good. All right. So let's get to it. This week's topic mm. is our smartphones and how, when, if we should be using those in our productions. And mm. I know that we use them kind of as a sort of ancillary tool at the moment. So Right now, I'm using mine to cut up to the internet and do this. We I use it for recording audio a bit using the smart labs. Um, I know you guys both use those as well. Mm -hmm. But for actually recording images for work projects, have either of you done this? For something that is going to a client or something that's going up on the YouTube that you're putting your name to, have either of you used cell phone footage? Today for the first time. Oh, in my uh, aperture so. MC video, because uh, I, I just got an iPhone seven. And this is the first time whoa, whoa, ever. Whoa, 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 whoa what? Something. Okay, wait, hold on a second. MC, whoa. you got an MC in the house? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, very exciting. Okay, yeah. cool. Video videos are live right. right now. Went up. Uh, oh, because I would. Oh, I didn't see that. I watched the the you know almost the part two of the. You know mm. everything on on the desk thing. I didn't Psycho know the guy thing. builds a desk. Video. No, very cool. Um, <laughs> just very quickly before you say that, not to totally interrupt, but um, do you enjoy it? Is it cool? Because I MC? know the price point. Yeah, the MC. It's, cr it's incredible. Wow, yeah. really? It's the first time where I am super excited to use an app that works wow. from here. I'm thrilled. There's two things in my life actually: that and the new Rhino Arc Two. Which, oh. I, which I purchased. I pre-ordered that bad boy. Yeah. yeah, That thing is the bee's knees. And it's been a long time coming, that product. Long time. But, oh my goodness, finally, like, perfectly smooth. It's like, it's like an O'Connor head that just follows your, follows what you want. Uh, well, no, but that's a is, that a, is that a video <laughs> next, is that a video next no, week? Not the arc. That's going to be a ways out. Too much. Yeah, and you're very happy with it so far. Thrilled so far. They they have some work to do on the app, but uh, mm -hmm. you know they upgrade that stuff all the time. But the hardware, it's the first time I've been able to put whatever I want on a motion control system and have it just barely move and be perfectly smooth. All the systems get kind of like weird at the low speeds. <clears throat> and you can put your speaking of phones. I know this is kind of way off, but you can put your phone on top of your camera on top of your arc similar and, to the roman s and C. your phone will talk to the arc and it'll use face tracking from your phone to have the arc follow you around the room so this Perfectly is similar to the, similar to the ronin sc where you put your right. phone on top and it will track you yeah and uh, then i heard okay. that the ziyun um you don't actually have to have your phone on top of the gimbal I know we're talking about a lot of different things right now, but um, 
the, you know, because that's the issue I had when I tested the SC was that you have to have the cell phone right on top of the, the mm. camera, basically. And when you're trying to balance, it's garbage. So it's like, it's great in theory, but if you mm. aren't putting a, a Sony RX on top of there, it's just way too top heavy and it's too hard to get the full range of motion for the gimbal. Right. But I've heard yeah, that on sense. the Zhiyun, um, you don't have to actually have it sitting on top of the camera. You can put it somewhere else and it will still track you. So, um, and, and just to answer what the MC is, because there's a question in the chat, that is the M color, basically. It's a color version of um, Aperture's small little light, but it's tied into their whole app ecosystem. And mm. go watch Caleb's video, which I'm going to watch uh, when we're done with the show. So I'm yeah. sorry, I digressed and I diverted and we pivoted. Um, go back to how you use the phone. I apologize. Um, um, so yeah, in, the, in that video, I, I the lights have magnets on the back and I have drop ceilings in the new space. So I just stuck them onto the drop ceiling metal bars. Yeah. Uh, and it's great because you can just set them and then you just sit down. You don't have to mess, touch the lights again. You can control everything from your phone. And that was the first time. And oh, and I wanted to get a shot of it. And I was just like, I got to take this camera off this rig. And I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to shoot it on my phone. And there's some limitations to the iPhone 7 in that it has really nasty. You know, when you use a like a certain filters on your camera lens, you see like if there's a sun or a bright light, you see that in blue kind of bouncing mm -hmm. around. It has that pretty severely, hmm. but um, but I didn't do any use any special apps. I was like, you know what? Who cares? It's behind the scenes. Uh, but I have shot some video with it outdoors, um, in natural light with my kids, and I can't believe that camera. Everything about it, the stabilization, uh, that wide angle lens, um, and just the image quality overall. And that's even with the basic app. I do have the Filmic Pro you know, whatever pack they have for that, that gets you log. And that's mm. gorgeous too. But uh, I haven't done, I'm hoping to do a video where I shoot a whole video of mine with just the iPhone and see how that goes. Mm. So anyway. So, do you, so with that, do you think then that it's, and, and I need to watch your video to see how that cuts in with everything else. Terribly. But I suppose terribly. Because it's, it's a jump, bad scenario. Really jumps out at you. Well, yeah. Yeah, like there was low light. I'm pointing it directly at a really bright light source. So it's like all jacked up that, you know, thing was dancing around. But yeah. with good light, like, again, if I was shooting outdoors all day, I would trust this thing. It'd be beautiful. Interesting. Jem, have you shot anything that you have put into work no. that has gone out into the world? Not really. I mean, I've used it for for episodes of um you know the channel so sometimes what i'll do is if i want to show what my setup is in fact the very first episode of gearbox which was the unofficial first episode which i did for able cine which is back in 2009 um which is still on my youtube channel i was in scotland and i had a, a setup and i was talking about double system sound and i I had one of the early iPhones and I used it to show what my setup was. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's been some advancements in terms of apps, things like, oh, shut up. Um, things like, uh, <laughs> I hate alarms, but I need them. Uh, you know, things like Filmic Pro and then, you know, iMovie, Luma Fusion, different apps that you can use to edit on the phone. But I do find um, I do find that the workflow is clunky for me because yeah. it's the whole idea of having to connect the phone to the computer and then get the stuff out of iTunes, which I know iTunes is going away. But it's just sort of the workflow of grabbing stuff that's a pain for me. Um, and I'm not saying it's much harder, but you know that's the deal. Yeah. Um, so I wonder on on that subject about the workflow and when you're trying to cut that in with other footage that hasn't been originated on a phone yeah. have either of you messed around with the uh, mobile versions of premiere and how that then goes into cloud and comes back down to your main mm, i have not edit machine i haven't either but i so i was wondering if you'd experience of no how that I mean, goes and whether that actually solves anything 
I, I mean, I, I, you know, for me at the moment, the, the device is really for controlling things that have to do with filmmaking. And they are, you know, extremely handy for that. I've tried stuff. I mean, I've really tried to do some things with gimbals and tried to shoot stuff with Filmic Pro, which I think is a, a, an unbelievable application. But I just find that at the moment, until we get whatever you want to call it, um, portrait mode with the, uh, you know, with the with the camera in video. So that it, that exists. Yeah. That does, it does exist. It does. Who has yeah. it? That was one of the reasons for prompting the this topic today. Samsung now have this on the their new uh, Note 10, I think Galaxy 10. I'm not sure if that's the exact right numbers, but they now have that in video, and I've seen a few samples of it, and it's horrible. Hey. It's it's really, you know, that now the last couple of generations of the stills version of that, they're getting the uh, the kind of the bokeh mode, and it's getting the hair line is getting about right now because of the mm. way that they're mm. measuring the distance so the time of flight sensors that they're using so that fourth camera on as things are now with the three um right sort of optical uh, focal lengths lenses that we've got and then the fourth being the time of flight that's now getting pretty good on video it's just clearly not there but it's clearly coming because i remember i had a, a camera for, uh, phone four or five years ago that had that technology and it was terrible for stills now it's pretty amazing so we're we're not far away from that surely and by and portrait you mean like being able to film like this but it's normal video no I, as in you... as in knocking the background out of focus as in oh, simulating like portrait shallow mode. depth of field i see i see yeah. i see okay yeah mm. yeah yeah so that is now yeah. that's now I, becoming I mean, a thing yeah you know you know, we were talking about aperture lights earlier on, and I know that the app ecosystem is getting really good with a lot of the lights on the market, on the high-end Stellar. You know, uh, Luxly has a really nice app for their cello and their timpani and their, you know, um, viola lights. And I, I thank goodness they redesigned that because it was absolute garbage before that. Um, but, you know... For me, the biggest problem with using these devices in production is that they're also your phone and your main communication device. Mm. So I've found that you know when it comes to things like drones and 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 gimbals, that you're almost better off buying a cheap, uh, you know, a cheap dedicated device, whether that's a tablet or a smartphone, to control all of those things. And that's hard, but a lot of us are going through. I mean, for us, it's it's not hard because we have a lot of kids, so we just basically they get the old phones, and that's the way the system mm -hmm. works. But for people who don't have that situation, then you should take your previous generation phone and just make it a dedicated device for all of your apps and for you know uh, everything but phone calls and email and texting and social media. And just use it as a device for Sunseeker or whatever you're using for that, and for a director's viewfinder, and for scouting locations, and 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 all of that stuff. And I think that that's really, you know, even though I don't have two devices, that's how I'm using my phone more than anything right now for production. And I would love to be able to use it for some of these other things. But when I've tried some of the gimbals that are, you know, designed specifically for smartphones, uh, like the Smooth 4, I just found it was a little clunky. And, you know, as somebody had mentioned, you get a phone call or a text in the middle of what you're doing mm -hmm. unless you shut everything off. And now you're turning off your essentially your business device. And so yeah. that makes it a little bit more difficult. And so I don't know. It's, you know, it's obviously going to advance. I don't see it being something that I won't use in production in the future. But I do find that, especially now that um, we're using mirrorless cameras so much, they're so good in low light, um, and we get used to having so much control over our image in a dedicated device, that it does become very difficult in anything outside of maybe journalism to, to use, um, you know, a, a, a smartphone for production. So I don't know. That's kind of my take on it. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and I, I, I'll jump in to say your that thing of like using your phone as a phone, and then at the same time, it's also a remote for all this different stuff. Mm. Uh, I do think that we're just now like coming around a corner where a lot of that pain goes away with the newest Bluetooth. I don't even remember the spec. Bluetooth five or yeah. whatever it is. Five, yeah. Um, the new aperture lights uses this system and of course they have the whole mesh network things so which is a whole other situation yes and then the arc as well um it just works like i never had to go into my bluetooth settings and connect just on the app it's like hey there's your arc and it just worked the same with the aperture lights um and then i could like leave come back and at worst i pulled up the app and it just said reconnect question mark and you tap that and it was like Thank goodness. I think the days are almost behind us of like going into your Bluetooth, waiting for the spinny spinny for the device to pop up, <laughs> connecting. Yeah. You walk five feet away, it disconnects in that whole mess. Yeah. But but I totally get that. Like, you know, email well, on that, and everything else. That that in terms of that speed and that reduction of latency as well that we've now we're now getting. Because whenever you, I mean, I'm assuming both of you have used apps on your phones to control cameras mm -hmm. so canon has one for the c200 and uh many other models all the manufacturers have them and it looks great get it all set up but then you're having to set up a wi-fi network for it for that to connect into and then the latency is absolutely horrific on it and then you walk not a huge distance away and the thing disconnects and then it's not just the case of it hooking back up and and that's been a source of frustration with everything I've ever used it for monitoring with. The The only thing that I do use it for quite a bit is using the little Osmo Pocket, um, which I play with every now and again. And it, it works quite nicely with that because it's a wired connection to it and, it, and that does monitor fairly well. Um, and just going back to what you were saying, Jim, about having tried for shooting with them and using the gimbals, to me that then takes the entire purpose of using a, a cell phone away because that that's the whole thing with it being small it being inconspicuous being the every i've just been wondering around prague prague's absolutely horrific in terms of the number of tourists on every single person is like this so if you're wanting to be incognito if you're wanting to just blend into the crowd and not people not know that you're shooting something that's going to a, a wider audience that's fantastic as soon as you get a gimbal on it it's something different and it's not that um inconspicuous device so i think from that point of view it's um, not the purpose that I was thinking of for using these. Um, and I think that I've always had this kind of uh, idea that it's cheating with these modes that we were talking about in terms of for shooting with these portrait modes that they've never been quite right, but they're getting pretty good now, as we were just saying, in terms of um, simulating um, bokeh. And I was, I was with a friend uh, who was he's quite into his photography with his phone and he's been getting some beautiful shots and he was saying, well, what, what really does it matter? You know, the end results the same. And I was all kind of raging and then couldn't actually give any reason why, <laughs> why not for the purposes that he was, he was using it. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. Hmm. And I think it's, I think it's down to what, what the end goal is for that media that you're producing and where that is going to be viewed. Um, I've just done a, a project um, for Jago actually, and that's all been, most of that's going on Instagram. So we've been shooting, or oh, it's been outputted in uh, 1920 by 1080, but 1080 by 1920. And you know that that's the biggest that's ever going to be viewed and it's going to be on that screen. Um, and you think, well, if, if something's going to end up on the cell phone and that's its end, its end use, are we then able to get away with shooting that content on there as well? Are we getting to that stage yet? Do we think? Huh. Jen's looking skeptical. No, I, I just think we're, you know, again, I think that the, the device has a lot of application for journalism and for documenting things. And that's incredibly important for news and, and the other things that are going on around the world. Um, I think it's hard for most of us to seriously look at that stuff 
when it comes to client-based production right now. I think the workflow is still too clunky and I think it'll get yeah. a lot better. How about you, Caleb? I don't, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of new to this whole, like even considering this because my last phone was a seven, mm. which was like, there's no way. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I feel like it's really, really close. Uh, if you can stabilize, like get, you know, not have it all zippy zippy, even though the stabilization is really solid. I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try to shoot a whole video and do it in a way that I can hide it if possible. See if people pick up on it and then do a video about, you know, shooting just with an iPhone. Um, see, yeah, it's even possible, you know, so I don't know. We'll see. But I, I it's it's the, the hardware and software is getting so close. Um, I, if there is, uh, I don't know if you can really get much better with the software. Yeah. The, the weird thing is like going from like a, a camera with buttons and dials and a way to change your focus physically to something like that. That just feels a little weird. Mm. Um, I wonder if there will be like a crossover period where if there's a way to tap into that with hardware of some kind. Hmm. You know, like uh, like if this had a little cage on either eye and there's a little little uh, uh, wheel to change your focus or something. Right. All that could get interesting. And we haven't talked about it. I don't know if you guys want to talk about it at some point in this discussion, but like lenses on these external yeah. lenses. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I never used them. I always thought they were kind of silly. But I mean, that's because I never had a phone that I would even bother <laughs> doing that with. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, yeah. so let's, um, so, so, so one thing that we should acknowledge is that one of the challenges when you're shooting with these devices, besides maybe picture quality is monitoring and the fact that you kind of need to have a second device in order to properly control and monitor what it is that you're doing. So that has to be part of the consideration, I think. Uh, to a degree. I'm not saying it can't be done. It's kind of like a selfie camera, but then are you looking at yourself the whole time you're looking at the camera? Um, you know, because when we use a mirrorless camera, we'll mm. use either a flip up, flip out screen, or we'll use an external monitor, and we can look at that for reference, but then we can look down the barrel of the lens when we are talking to the audience, if we're talking to an audience. And that's going to be a little bit different with a smartphone. It's also very hard to you know, feel like you're looking down the barrel of a lens when you're looking at a, at a smartphone. Um, I imagine that longer term, what we would do is we would use the, you know, the multiple cameras that are on the device that we use to take photographs. So when we're looking at the phone, we're looking at those lenses, and then we are still gonna have to have something that we can monitor off of. I mean. Somebody mentioned it here. Selena, Selena Gomez's new music video was shot on an iPhone 11 Pro. Um, obviously, there's a couple of directors, Soderbergh being the big one, that has shot feature films on iPhones. But we have to acknowledge, as most of us do, that when that's being done, it's being done to push using that technology in a not unconventional way, but not the way you would necessarily think it would be used. But you're also talking about Steven Soderbergh, who has an entire film crew and mm -hmm. has great locations and is possibly going to be using some lens adapters, including potentially a 35 millimeter lens adapter, though I don't know if he uses those. And so all of those things, you know, contribute to creating higher production value. You know, Citizen Kane is the most famous movie of all time shot with a deep depth of field. Everything is in focus in that movie. And quite honestly, if you took an iPhone 11 Pro and you framed up your shots and you were able to use your cameras the right way um, and you wanted to have a deep depth of field and then you made the movie you know, using Filmic Pro and you shot the whole thing and it was in black and white, it could probably look amazing with a film crew you know, with mm. lighting and everything else, uh, and of course, great audio. But it's, it's going to take a lot, though I don't think it's going to take a lot of time, but it's going to take a lot of quick advancement in technology for us to start thinking about using these tools for creating higher-end content for our clients. I think it's going to happen, yeah. quite honestly, 
but I think that we're still a little bit away. And the reason I think it's going to happen is because look at what's happened to photography. I mean, the impact that the smartphone has had, really the camera you know, app and the camera component of these phones has completely changed the entire photo industry. And I don't see that necessarily being any different with video. Um, and it just means we have to be better at what we do. And, and, and we can use the tools as well. But man, we have to know our tech and our craft for sure. I know yeah. the no brainer comment, but like more and more boys and girls, if you if you can do the whole lighting thing, like you're set, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But so and what you were saying, Caleb, a minute ago about the software, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's where all this advancement's been being it's where it needs to carry on going because we're limited by the physics of what we can do what we can put into a phone because of the size of it now now that the a lot of the the longer lenses that they're putting on them they're actually using periscope lenses to be able to get some length onto them so rather than you know, you've got your um your sensor and then you've got this tiny distance to your lenses so if you can then use this periscope system to get more uh, more physical space between mm. those two bits, which is what they're they're doing now to be able to get these longer focal lengths into cameras, and then that takes us neatly into the red phone and what the hell happened there. Mm. It's pretty well, simple, so, in my opinion. Yeah, it's just a it's just a beefed up, beautiful, expensive looking Android phone, right? Right. So, at, at its base, that's what it is, right? And it was it was a little bit like it was the Brexit phone because it had this basic bit to it that sort of people understood, but then there was going to be all this amazing other stuff that was going to go onto it, none of which materialized. So to me, it was an exciting announcement in that when it when they first started talking about it, they were talking about and there was all these patent um, uh, things that people had found and all these different attachments that they were going to put on, and you were going to then have these modules that would clip onto it and then that would be a lens mount or there would be a mm. sensor within that and then you're going to be able to rig this thing up pretty much into into a, a full-fledged cinema camera with all these different modules which was really interesting and also kind of screaming pointlessness at the same time as to why would you start with that as the base from that when you already have the, the whole red system is that anyway um, but if there were ways that you could be putting your lenses onto those very relatively easily uh, that was interesting, and none of that materialized, and it just seems to have disappeared off into nowhere now. So I don't know yeah. if either of you two know what the status of that is in terms of whether it is just dead or whether there's any development planned on it still. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, those folks over there seem to get easily distracted, right? <laughs> and, uh, but they they're working on a version two, apparently, of the phone. Right. Yeah. And then they have that whole really? Red Mag explos explosion happened to them so i wonder if there's you know and then uh all this stuff with yeah. sigma's camera and then you know everyone's got an 8k raw camera with a large sensor coming out for like four grand or less and now yes. they're like now on instagram they're like wow remember all those tweets i think we talked about it on the show how like you know jim just went down the hall and went around the door he's like hey graphic designer guys can you uh can you like make something look reddish and, and put a little CF letter and a red light next to it? Thanks. Unbelievable. Hey, let's digress here for a second and talk about red because I think okay. that what you're saying, Caleb has a lot of, uh, has a lot of weight to it. It, it. You know, aside from the whole little PR kerfluffle and everything else, um, we are in a time now where virtually every single camera company is coming out with a 6K camera, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we we have at least from a sensor standpoint, and so there's a there's a, a lot of stuff going on right now, and it's interesting. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday. Um, I think of all of the companies right now, Red is the company that probably has to really look at what their next camera is and where that camera comes into the market almost more so than anybody. Look, Aries, Aerie, they've got it. They've got their space. That's not going to change. 
Um, yeah. And then in the sub $10,000 range, there's a lot of options. They're all great for different reasons. Um, I have my favorites, but everybody else will, will choose other cameras. And then we kind of had this weird, you know, twelve to sixteen thousand dollar range, which is going to be the FX9 and the C500 Mark II. But specifically, the C500 Mark II. Look at that camera. Um, it's essentially a C700 for half the cost, and it will mm -hmm. record internally in 5.9K up to 60 frames per second. Um, you know, at, at, at in RAW in a compressed RAW format. And so at that point in time, when they're offering that camera in a PL mount and, you know, you look at what the specs are that you get out of a camera system like that, we really are moving into different times. And I think that that next camera from RED, regardless of the Android phone, regardless of everything else, um, the camera that they're teasing, I think, is more important than people may actually realize, especially even though they're not a camera company, you have a company like Blackmagic doing what they're doing with their 6K camera for $2,500, you know? It's just, it's it's crazy times, and uh, they're really gonna have to come up with something that will continue to uh, push that, that red brand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think they've got a lot of damage limitation to do right now. Mm. You know, it, it really, like you say, it, it's a very pivotal point for them. And whatever this this becomes, it, it is make or break time to an extent, I think, or with certain segments of the market. Certain segments. I mean, there's no question that they're making better cameras that are very capable cameras. There's a ton of content that's being shot um, for Netflix and Amazon and, and other places using red cameras. And in fact, um, until this recent, you know, LF and, and mini LF camera, there mm. wasn't a camera from Airy that was technically okay to use to shoot for Netflix, except for the 65, right? I think that's the only one that you could, you could technically use for that. Um, so they're, they're still in the game, but I think that they absolutely have to come up with a winner of a camera next time. And they have to start to come into a price point that is going to compete with the C500 Mark IIs. And they'll continue to create a lot of excitement. But look, you've got Zcam, um, you know, and you've got these other cameras from Blackmagic. And, uh, and then the smaller format, S1H, and, the, you know, and this little FP. There's a lot of competition out there. And the FP, the think price on that, it's absurd. It's yes. $1,900 or whatever. Awesome. Full frame raw camera. Yeah. Who knows if you have It's a really problem. exciting little thing. I love the look of that thing. Yeah. So it makes me happy. It. It's like it asking to get rigged up to whatever you need. Yeah. Great. It's exciting. It's good. Um, on all just that, that, it's amazing. Yeah. It's interesting. So just a quick question on the red thing then. If we, if, if they're going to go and, and sort of slightly change their model, do you think that they're going to put kind of architecture into memory and open and be using more yeah. generic? Yeah. Yeah, I think they have to be. I mean, yeah. the reality is they can't, they can't have another PR nightmare, mm -hmm. right? And we know what things cost. And we also understand that there's cost to run a company but there's a you know there's a fine line there and when you're competing with canon and sony mm. you know and their media costs a lot less and now the resolution is there um arguably the color science is there and you know all of that stuff i think that at a certain point you have to just say i mean look it's happening in every industry i see the lighting industry is is now reacting to the lower cost lights that are coming out of China. And so, you know, mm -hmm. and, and not everything, but a large majority of it in terms of the big companies is also manufactured in China. So the consumer is relatively educated nowadays. So you're not going to be able to drop your prices to compete with, you know, a monitor uh, or a light that is a quarter of the price 
but you are going to have to compete to a certain degree and say, okay, but we're a U.S. company or we have a better warranty or we have these other things, which are important to customers because if they can have a point of contact, then that's worth something. Um, the monitors that you've been reviewing, Caleb, which I think are very interesting, are they the Andy something? What's the name of the company? Um, uh, Andy Cine. Andy Cine. I mean, look, they, they stepped up the game and they really did an amazing job in creating a user interface and a user yeah. experience, which, you know, is for the first time we're really seeing from a company outside of the bigger companies. But at the same time, um, we can see that both Atomos and Small HD are reacting to the industry. They're reacting to each other, but they're reacting to the industry. And you have monitors by both of those companies with strong user interfaces and, you know, and, and things like that. And they're selling them for $299. So now you look at Andy Cine and you say, okay, so I can get that monitor for $240 or $230. The, the difference in price used to be much bigger. Um, do I want to do that or not? Um, so, you know, that's, uh, it's pretty interesting, right? Yeah, everyone's yeah. yeah. The price, the pricing game in a lot of ways, just in the last six months, has been interesting. It's really changed. Like uh, it, Ad, Atomos yeah. comes out with this this Shinobi monitor, and Small G drops their price. This Andy Cine comes out, and a bunch of other Feel World, like China, just released a billion monitors. And mm -hmm. did, didn't the Shinobi drop again? It might have, but I know that like all three hundred or three fifty instead of four. Maybe for the but but what happened was Small HD released all of their focus monitors, including the SDI and OLED versions. They're all two hundred and ninety nine dollars now. So crazy. crazy. And mm -hmm. and in my opinion, and I haven't tried the Andy Cine, but in my opinion, Small HD in terms of monitors has the strongest user interface right oh, now. Absolutely. Um, so their struggle know, I, is like you know resolution and a couple other things but yeah i would gladly pay an extra 60 dollars for that user interface and that usability and that's a big deal plus i can power my camera off of it you know because they have the dummy battery solutions so yeah. um i think that that's great so you have to really think about all of those things this is not a oh this company's better than another it is a very very clear thing that's happened as you said caleb in the last six months where these uh, American and European companies um, are reacting to the whole industry. They're reacting to each other, but also what's coming out of China. And, um, and you know, we're all winning because of it. It's just uh, so much better for everybody here. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Um, like when you look at the industry right now, Ben, um, you know, what, what are you seeing in terms of trends? And like Eric's saying, Eric's, uh, Eric's here, uh, Naso, our buddy, um, 2020 is going to be a tough year for camera manufacturers. AK TVs are just not going to be the big selling point in the U S I agree. 6k is a stop gap before 8k in about two years, but I think it's giving us the ability to reframe and to do some, some things yeah. in post 4k. Like, where do you see this stuff going? And it's tricky and it's always difficult to know whether things are going to keep chasing that kind of resolution race. I remember that that was always a thing with, you know, my background stills photography and that was always a thing. It was going after megapixels, megapixels, megapixels. That was the, that was the selling point and everything for so long before everyone kind of got tired of that and started looking at things that are far more important to the quality of an image. Um, so I think that seems to be, well, I say it seems everything's gone, 6K has been it this year. And I'm not sure that we will see that big sort of splurge of 8K cameras coming anytime soon. I don't think it's um, at the moment, like, as Eric's saying, just in terms of you know, what, what's it for, the 6K, obviously we, we're, we've got options free for 4K with that. But uh, that's interesting. But it, And I think the, the big thing, as you were saying, Gem, as well, that, that's happened the last two or three years are these kind of very small... Um, Chinese brands, and particularly in terms of camera manufacturers, that all of a sudden people are taking very seriously and seeming to have some trust in. Um, I remember the, when, uh, oh, it was the first one that, that uh, Philip Bloom did a, a quite a lot of work with them. What were they called? I've got one in the morning brain. Um, Wait, what is it? The, the Chinese Oops. camera brand. 
the, oh, the cinema Infinity. camera brand. Infinity. Yeah, the Kinef yeah, the Kinfinity brand came out. And everyone was incredibly skeptical about buying a, a cinema camera from, from a Chinese brand that didn't have that backup. And you go sort of, what are we talking, a year, two years down the road, and that seems to have changed completely in terms of confidence in in those brands so that's interesting and i guess that's that's with products across the board which is exactly mm. what you were saying jen yeah I, I by the way chris i think 6k will be very popular and i think it'll be popular not because we're chasing the resolution game i think it's going to be very popular because so many people are cutting stuff in full hd and shooting in uhd 4k and so they they want to punch in they want to reframe they want to do that stuff and as we start to push our content out to clients in 4K, which is starting to happen, um, people will want yeah. some, at least some degree of that ability for 4K. And it, it, the, the math would say 8K for 4K, but those cameras really aren't here in quantity. If we're using 6K for 4K, we can basically punch in 140 to 160% depending on the camera system and the resolution of the, you know, the sensor and how it's recording. But 5.9 to 6K basically says we can punch in 140 to what is it, like 160% in, um, you know, in 4K. So uh, it's, you know, it's pretty interesting all around in terms of that stuff. Uh, I don't know, Caleb, I think we're, do you agree that as we move towards that, that, um, that 6K will become very popular? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, clearly that's where it's kind of going. Maybe not with TVs. We're not going to see 6K TVs, but yeah, um, yeah, I think it's great. It's like having a having an ex, it's like having a safe area around what you're filming right now. Exactly. You know, it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I don't think it's about the higher resolution for delivery. No. It's just what can we do with those extra pixels in post production that will be the benefit to a lot of people when they're doing stuff. Um, yeah. We're close, Ben. We're, we're a few minutes away. We are close. We've got five minutes. So do you want to do a little wrap up? Where do we see in terms of going back to our original subject briefly? <laughs> <laughs> where do we, uh, we digress slightly, which is, which is good. Um, where do we see things going in now in terms of, are we are we now getting to the the edges of what we can do in terms of the physics mm. of of cameras, and therefore, you know, it, are we thinking this modular thing in the way that Red was hinting at with their yeah. camera, which it's come? Is that what we're looking at? And what you were talking about about the lenses to to go over. Are we looking at systems and camera systems becoming something that we see that phones being a pivotal part of, so that there's a phone mm. and then a lens system around that. And maybe even in terms of external recording from those things, which all seems ridiculous to me. But yeah, do we think that's where things are going to? I don't mean in terms of a, this is a great thing that we need for doing production work, but are we thinking in terms of you know, marketing hype? Where do they go next? What's the new? So what's the new selling point. This is a big. This is a big stretch between two sides of it. Um, the Airy sensor is 11 years old, believe it or not, which is crazy. And every single Airy camera that's been made uses that same sensor as either a single or a double or three of them together. And they, they build their cameras off of that, which is kind of amazing. And, uh, and nobody would argue that if you could get your hands on a super 35 millimeter Alexa mini, even two or three years from now that you couldn't create amazing content because we've watched, you know, the Avengers and, all of these other huge big blockbuster movies being shot with that sensor and being projected in 4k even though it's not natively a 4k sensor and so blah 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 what the reason i'm mentioning that is that i think that there's a big difference and a big jump when we talk about cell phone and mobile technology in terms of being able to create images that give us what we're getting out of higher end digital cinema cameras at the same time it's pretty clear that the way we're gonna be getting images that are more cinematic from those devices is we're gonna be sitting there with not quite a Lytro, but we're gonna have many lenses in the camera. And then there's gonna to have to be a really, really fast processor in there so we get true, you know, real time portrait, you know, basically aperture um, control over the image. And it's, it's grabbing that depth information in real time. Um, and I think coupled with, um, you know, cancer causing 5G technology, 
that we're going to be able to push real-time images from smartphones it, that are going to be really pretty amazing uh, and will probably be great in low light in the future too. We can see the advancements just in one year in terms of what's happening on the still side with um, the AI and everything else that's inside of these phones. I think we're realistically a minimum of two, possibly three years away from having a real conversation like this about using these devices in production. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very, and interesting that thing about using things like the Lytro and being able to put that in and that give that takes away a lot of the restrictions that we have in terms of the physical form factor. That's right. uh, yeah. processing. Processing is going to be the key. It's got we've got to process the depth information that's being captured by the camera in real time so that we can yes. change depth of field and we can push that out. Um, almost instantly or have a plug-in for our NLEs to be able to control that quickly because we don't want to have to think about it, right? You want to click on a place in the frame, you want to define what your f-stop is, and you want everything else to fall into place. That's the way people want it to work, right? So you take a, a yes. shot of somebody in the woods and do you want that to feel like it's f11 or is it uh, an f2? Well, you point to or click on whatever the thing is in the frame that you want to be in focus, and then you define by typing in an aperture what you want it to be. That's where we're going for sure when it comes to these devices, but I still think we're uh, probably a few years off. Yeah. Hmm. Agreed. Hmm. Any last thoughts on that, Caleb, before we sign off and go to bed? No, I think uh, either the processors get better so we have the, the fake looking real stuff or we see that phone small size tech work its way into cameras like the FP and we kind of have this weird crossover transition period or something. I don't know. Yep. Go ahead and see. It's very interesting. Lovely right. as well as. Lovely as always. I was hoping the reason I really chose this subject was because I need to buy a new phone next week and I was hoping that I'd get some insight and I'm as confused as I was when we started. So there 11 we go. Bro. Can't go yeah. wrong. No. Just get an 11 Pro. Be done with it. I, I can't do iPhones for all sorts of reasons. Oh, we know. Okay. But we're just <laughs> telling you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's not happening. That's not happening. Me and Apple are they're done. Yes, but I know. The, the, old, the, the old joke in it. How do you milk a sheep? Release a new iPhone. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> You're ridiculous. And boom. <laughs> Amazing. Right, gents, I'm going to bed. You Sleep well. Don't I? Yeah. Thank you very much. A pleasure, as always, to hang out with you two and with all of you in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Love you guys. Next week, yep. get in again. Always this time, same time every week. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to Gem's channel, make sure you do that for not only this, but all the other amazing content that he produces. And uh, see you all next week. Yeah, and watch uh, Caleb's video on the MC. And next week I will host, and maybe we'll do a challenge, gentlemen. Maybe Ooh. we'll do a challenge. Caleb? Mm. Yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you, golden child. And oh, uh, oh, look at that. Look oh, at it. No, no. Amazing. All right. You guys are awesome. All Love the you best. guys. Love everyone in the chat. Have a good night. See you guys. Night night.